So good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Um, housekeeping, we're going to expect to go five minutes late because we're starting five minutes late. For, word from our sponsor. Um, so uh, this, this session um, is very exciting. Um, and I'm going to introduce Ellen Mira. This is the session, by the way, if you're the wrong, you may be the wrong one, if you're, what's the name of the session again? Remember? Report from the Leading Edge. <laughs> no, no, this is, re, this is a report from the Leading Edge about innovations in reimbursement and compensation. I just forgot. Um, so uh, my name is Ken Rosenfield. I'm a member of uh, the class of 13 for the MHCDS program. And uh, one of the more fun uh, engagements we had was with uh, Ellen Mira, who's one of our professors. And I actually remember um, a distinct, there's some things that stick in your mind. Uh, and uh, Ellen came in one day at, at class and said, you know, um, a couple of weeks ago, my, my kid and I were cooking together in the, uh, and, you know, my eight-year-old, uh, and, and he cut himself, and it was like a Sunday, and, and I couldn't tell, I'm not a medical person, I couldn't tell, is this something I need to go to the ED for or not? And I'm thinking telehealth, telehealth, but... Um, <laughs> And, uh, and she said, you know, if I go to the ED with my plan, it's like, you know, it's going to cost, I know it's going to be a $500, you know, you walk into the emergency room, it's a, it's a $500 cost right off the bat. And that's not good for the healthcare system. It's not, I'm going to sit there for three or four hours and he's going to be miserable. And who knows, it may be nothing. It may not even be worth going to the ED. And I don't know, I don't have enough knowledge to make this decision. And, and actually telehealth would be the answer to that. But the problem is that telehealth is not set up. It's not reimbursed. There's no way for the cost, the provider to get reimbursed for that effort and energy and so on and so forth. And, and you know, what a perfect segue for this, this um, discussion about compensation um, and how, you, how do we figure this out in the new, uh, in the accountable care era so that we, I mean, that's a low-hanging fruit. That's really low-hanging fruit because probably n nine out of ten providers could look at that thing um, on a, in a picture and, and say, don't worry about it, Ellen. By the way, whatever happened? It was nothing. We stay, my my um, eight-year-old daughter looked up on the Internet, <laughs> and we concluded <laughs> that we did not need to go to the emergency department. <laughs> <laughs> Internet to the rescue. Perfect. So. Self-education. Uh, a physician in, uh, in uh, you know, If you knew my daughter, you knew that actually she had it under control. She said, <laughs> she said control. sign her up for my program tomorrow. Yeah. Um, all right, so Ellen is a, an associate professor of health policy and clinical practice at the Gazelle um, School of Medicine. And uh, her, 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 uh, she was a faculty research fellow. She also is a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, she has a PhD in economics from Harvard uh, in 1999. She was on the faculty of the Harvard um, Healthcare Policy um, Program and joined the Dartmouth Institute in 2010, and it was kudos to Dartmouth for getting her. Um, her research is on um, uh, how, to, uh, how do the non-clinical non factors like education, coverage, payer coverage policies, disability, eligibility, and so on affect health and health care. Um, employment and well-being in and and she really focuses on the vulnerable populations of patients the patients that, that are uninsured the dual dual eligibles the uh, substance abusers and and patients with mental health issues which is a huge problem in our huge issue in our system um, she has uh, multiple grants from um, NIH HRQ the Commonwealth Fund uh, etc she is a great educator she teaches health policy uh, and also economics to undergraduates, and also in the MHCDS program. She, um, she uh, tells me as we were walking in that uh, one of the most exciting things she does, did was back uh, about 10 years ago, she uh, led this Institute of Medicine Committee on uh, smoking cessation in the military. She said it was the highest rate of smoking cessation in Ever, ever known to any other program. That's because you entered into training, and when you were into training, you were not allowed to smoke. But the problem was that the recidivism afterwards was the worst. So th th this is, um, you know, one of the other issues we have to grapple with: is how do we maintain the sustainability of the things that we do? Um, Ellen's learning winter sports since moving up to Dartmouth, <laughs> um, and uh, and we're going to hear more about that. So. Uh, <laughs> Skier. Afterwards. Afterwards. Uh, so um, thank you for leading this panel. We really are excited about it. 
Thank you very much. Um, oh wait, I have I have a mic, so I'm going to give this to you. Maybe okay. turn it off for a minute. Well, I, so it's wonderful to be here. Thanks. Uh, just a, a quick word about Ken Rosenfield, who's an interventional cardiologist and has more energy than an Energizer Bunny. Um, <laughs> Many of you in this room will remember a period in the 70s and 80s where the most fun you could have was to go to a pizza parlor and they might have Pong, you know, one of those tables. You guys know what I'm talking about? The Pong game. This was so much fun. Yeah. Having an email exchange with Ken is like playing Pong. It keeps coming back. <laughs> and there's always a curious and insightful comment, and that's what makes Ken so delightful. So um, it, it's great interacting with Ken and being back here. So very briefly, how are we going to set this up? So we have three wonderful talks, very different settings. We're going to learn about Vermont and single payer. We're going to learn about Massachusetts and the alternative quality contract. And Carrie is going to be our cleanup hitter here, talking about some national data. Um, and, and I just want to say a word about Zuri. And Carrie um, have uh, graciously agreed to share some hot off the press, not published and not you know, able to be circulated data. So get out your notepads, take notes, um, because we're really grateful they're sharing this and you're getting a sneak preview of what hopefully will be widely published very soon. Um, let me just quickly, so what we're going to do, they're each going to talk for about 10 minutes. And we're going to have about five minutes of follow-up um, after each. So this is a little bit different than your prior session. And we'll have some wrap-up time at the end. Um, so let me just introduce all three of them, because I don't want to take away from any of their time. Robin Lunge, as many of you know in this room, is a graduate of the Master's in Health Delivery Science. But she is a, also a lawyer by training. And she has this small title of Director of Health Reform in Governor uh, Peter Shumlin's office in the state of Vermont and has a very challenging thing. Robin said this insightful thing the other day that she was a Vermonter through and through. And I thought about what that means. Well, she's absolutely right. She's extremely hardworking. You know that Vermonters work harder than anybody else I've ever met. She's also extremely generous with her time. Her demeanor is very understated, but let me assure you her impact is not. So we're very pleased to have Robin. Um, uh, and, and Robin is, of course, a star, and we know this. But we also have Zuri and Carrie, who are two rising stars. So here you are. You know, get out your lighters and your phones and wave them. Because <laughs> when they become the king and queen of health policy, you can say, I saw them way back when. And I'm a fan of their early work. So, um, so Zuri is um, shortly to earn his MD from Harvard Medical School. He already holds a PhD in health policy from Harvard, which is how I know him. We overlap during my time at Harvard. Um, he is uh, already a very accomplished researcher who's done a lot of work on the alternative quality contract in Massachusetts and does an excellent job of sharing it with the world. Um, and he is soon to start his residency at the Mass General Hospital in internal medicine. So that's Zuri. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Ken cannot wait. Uh, Carrie Kala has her PhD from Berkeley in health services and policy analysis. She focused on economics, so she is an economist. Um, she did some uh, groundbreaking work, as Elliot uh, alluded to, on the physician group practice demonstration project. We all rode her coattails on a study that's been widely published and publicized. And Carrie has been spearheading this national survey of accountable care organizations, which has a lot of detail. Now, of course, Ken is very optimistic and was hoping that we'd solve all payment and reimbursement challenges in this session. We may not, but I think you'll learn some really <coughs> important lessons. So with that, I'm going to give it to Robin. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm going to stand up. Um, so thank you all for for coming today and joining us here at Dartmouth. Um, and for those of you who were here before, welcome back. Um, I'm going to talk today about a part of our healthcare reform aspects that actually I don't normally speak much to. Um, I'm usually asked to come talk about the coverage and legal policy aspects of Green Mountain Care, which is our universal healthcare system that we're building for the state of Vermont, which is modeled to be the nation's first single payer state based program. Uh, what I'm going to actually talk about today is a lot of the exciting work that's happening in our delivery system uh, right now. So our governor, Governor Shumlin, indicated when he was first elected that his goal was to move to a single-payer health care system, but in order to do that, we needed to bend the cost curve. 
because what we knew from our experience over the past 20 years in Vermont is that the rising costs of health care were not affordable in our current system and that our current system was not sustainable. And one of the things he likes to say is, you know, maybe if your corner dry cleaner goes out of business, you'll go find another dry cleaner, but you really can't take that approach to your hospitals. So uh, it's very important for us to get delivery system reform and uh, right. Now, part of what uh, is unique about what we're doing in Vermont is not so much the reimbursement models in and of themselves, but our approach to it uh, as both government as a leader and, and as a convener, and also um, on a statewide multi-payer basis. So what I'm gonna talk about is how we as a state have been trying to pull together our provider community to really do, quite frankly, the hard work. Because we certainly realize that you can't legislate or dictate good care and good care delivery. Uh, that shouldn't be government's role and that's not the role that we're trying to take. But we can be a role of, we can take the role of convening people, bringing them together and working across payers and across providers to ensure that uh, we really are aligning incentives across the system as a whole. So uh, the approach and our focus and our premise is that misaligned financial incentives across payers and providers has led to the fragmentation in our social and medical systems. And so uh, by linking financing to value, we can fill gaps and strengthen the system. That's really the premise of what we're, we're focused on in Vermont. And so what are, we trying to, what are we trying to do through the Healthcare Innovation Project? We're trying to align policy, investments, and payment to support a high-performing health system in Vermont. Uh, our aim is to improve care, improve health, and reduce costs. Everybody knows the triple aim, but we're really following along with that focus. And we're trying to do that through rewarding integration and coordination, creating a health information system that supports improved care and really is f becomes an infrastructure. So just like our systems of roads or our system of um, uh, you know, phone systems and utility systems, we see health information technology as really a system that we as a state need to invest in and build across all providers uh, to ensure that we have that, uh, that ability for providers to use it to improve care. And then of course aligning uh, financial incentives. So what we did is we applied to the federal government for a state innovation model grant. We received $45 million over three years um, and we've and you can see on the slide some of the um, key budget items that we have been focused on and that how we will use that money. Uh, one of the, the very exciting things that we announced this past week was $2.6 million to different provider projects. So we put out a grant, grant announcement and we asked providers all around Vermont and New Hampshire who serve Vermonters, hey, you know, we want to see some innovation. What do you want to do? What do you need funding for? How can we help you by providing you with some investment dollars to really uh, take whatever your focus or project is to the next step? And so uh, our, we have two different grant rounds. We just awarded the first. So that's going to be really exciting to see how that goes. So what do, we, what do we think of as success? We think it would be, we would find success if we can build a health information technology and health information exchange system that A, works. <laughs> now that sounds simple. We know it's not that simple. Uh, that providers actually use also sounds simple, but uh, it's not that simple. And produces the analytics that we need and to really support the system. Uh, we would like to see a predominance of payment models that reward better value. In fact, the target that the federal government has set us as a state is 90% adoption across all payers um, at the end of the three years. And then, of course, creating a true system of care management across providers and provider systems so that we really do have an integrated system across all providers and all payers in the state of Vermont. And that that system would build off of the advanced practice medical homes and community health team model that Vermont has had in place since the mid-2000s uh, or so. So uh, we think that the ultimate objective of any payment reform is to motivate behavioral change that leads to lower costs, better coordination, and better quality. Um, and so let's just get into how are we actually doing that. So our project has uh, a very robust stakeholder um, 
engagement and public private across the board. So we have a core team. The core team is a mix of public officials, state officials, and private um, providers and payers. Uh, they sit, we sit, I'm on the core team, we sit together as a decision making body over how we spend the grant funds and across the different models that we're developing and measures and that kind of thing. And then we have a much bigger steering committee that has a huge number of folks both within state government and from the provider and payer communities. And then we have a number, you can see quite a few little projects um, along the bottom. And each of these projects has uh, both, again, private and public engagement so that each box is a different part of what we see as part of, this, of um, the delivery system reform that we're trying to achieve. So we have, for example, a quality and performance measures work group. That group, excuse me, in a minute we'll talk about some of the tangible progress that we've made, but that group was instrumental in coming to a, a, a one set of shared measures across payers and providers that will be used for uh, all three of our accountable care organizations um, and which are with some variation because of the different populations will be used uh, by Medicare, Medicaid, and the commercial payers. So we're really going for statewide and uh, uniformity across payers to the extent that that makes sense. Uh, so this is this, I won't go through this slide, but it just gives you a sense of how we've structured our work groups. Um, you can see that we've really put a premium on having private sector involvement. So the chairs of our, co-chairs of each of our work groups with some exceptions are almost all from the private sector and are almost all either from a payer uh, or from a provider organization or from uh, a social services organization. So the way our project structure works is each of the work groups are working on policy and spending in their particular area. They make recommendations that they then float up to the steering committee where it gets a much broader vetting across the, the huge group of people who sit on that committee. Then it goes up to the core team and then it, it either impacts on policies of state government, for example, in the Medicaid program or private payers and providers. So uh, it's meant to really have this process to fully vet different ideas, get people all on the same page. So we have built uh, consensus and collaboration, not that that means everybody gets everything that they want. Um, and it flows through this process and then gets adopted by whoever the entity is or whether it's the state or Blue Cross Blue Shield um, to implement in the real world. So, as I said, we have three complementary models that we're testing in the next three years. Uh, that's the Shared Savings ACO program. We have three ACOs in the state of Vermont. Uh, you've heard a little bit already about One Care, which is a collaboration between Fletcher Allen and Dartmouth Hitchcock and has uh, all of Vermont hospitals as members. Uh, we also have an ACO that is led by our FQHC network. And we have a third ACO, which is led by independent physicians in the Burlington area. Uh, and the ACO program is the program that is most developed right now in Vermont and has uh, been implemented across uh, commercial Medicaid and Medicare um, starting this January. So it's still pretty new in terms of the implementation, but we were able to get similar standards across all, all of our payers and have that be implemented this year. Uh, we're also working on episodes of care. That's really in the development stage. And then we'll move on to pay for performance. So I think some of our key progress, although the, the actual on the ground implementation has taken a while to get to, I think that's because we really have focused so much on ensuring that we're doing this as a statewide multi-payer initiative so that we have everybody in the state engaged and on board. So we have approved and standards for shared savings ACOs. Um, we took the Medicare shared savings program and then we adapted it for the different populations that are more common in the commercial sector and then also for Medicaid. So uh, the, the, the standards are very similar across all three uh, sets of payers. Uh, we have <coughs> quality measures, again, 
there's a core set of measures that are the same across all of the payers. And then there's a little bit of variation depending on the population because, of course, for Medicaid, there may be some additional measures that uh, you'd want for, those, for that particular group of people. Um, we have all of our contracts in place for the ACOs. And now the work groups have moved on to other uh, issues around health information, uh, where are the duplication and gaps in our care management and care models across the state, and how do we improve payment models to promote population health and coordination. Um, I think one of the most exciting things that I've seen that has come out of this process is that we are having unprecedented engagement between our hospitals and our long-term care community as well as uh, hospitals and our designated mental health agencies. So we really are starting to see uh, those connections across the system of care uh, in ways that even as a small state we hadn't seen before. So I think that's really one of the successes that uh, I am hopeful we will achieve over the next year is really solidifying those relationships and figuring out ways to cross those natural boundaries between providers. <coughs> Um, so the other key point is how will we measure the results? Uh, we are trying to evaluate the program. That is a requirement of the federal government giving us $45 million, so that's good. Um, and so we are looking at two key questions. What kinds of innovative approaches result in reduced costs while improving or maintaining the standard of care, patient health, and quality of life, and satisfaction of the workforce? And to the extent that a particular approach is promising, what contextual factor, factors need to be in place to make su success likely? And where are the challenges? Because really what we're trying to do is ensure that everything that we're working towards uh, can be implemented across the entire state um, and uh, that we understand why did it work with the, in this particular practice, for example, and uh, what were the factors that led to that, and how do we then make sure that as we try to duplicate that, we're taking that into consideration. So I will, I think I went way over time, but I will stop now for questions, right? Yeah, so oh, you, you can turn one. that off for a minute. Um, I just want to uh, lead off a question first, and I'll probably ask each of you something similar so you, you have more advanced time. <laughs> but I'm curious about, um, you know, even though this is a very unique model, you're looking at single payer, a lot of the things you have to tackle to make it work are very familiar. And, and people, states are in very different places as they embark on this. You've been thinking about it longer than some states. So I'm curious about what was surprising, both good or bad, what were the things that you really couldn't have anticipated that you now, you know, look at and say, oh, yeah, you know, we should have, we should have known, but we didn't. It was surprising, whether it's good or bad. You did mention the engagement yeah. between the hospitals and the long-term care, but were there other things? Yeah, so I think um, one of the surprising things that uh, we've learned is really uh, how long it takes to, to really build this kind of engagement and uh, collaboration and that sounds collaboration and engagement sounds easy but it really is very hard uh, very granular day-to-day -day work getting pe the right people in the right room to talk to each other and so I think it the amount of time and energy and commitment you need to that is can't be underestimated I would say that was one of the biggest um, so I'm not sure if it was a surprise so much but sort of the length of time to me seemed uh, like it felt like we should have been able to get there faster, but we really just needed to do the work. All right, so let's thank you very much. Let's open it up to you all for questions, and we don't have a microphone, so please, you know, speak up. Let us know. I will. Uh, great talk, thank you, Robin. Yeah. The, I'm not clear on the Medicare administration, so some of the ACOs might be participating in the Medicare ACO pilots. With the single single payer plan, is your intent to administer the Medicare dollars? So uh, with Medicare, uh, and let me make a distinction between Green Mountain Care, the single payer coverage plan, and uh, the work that we're doing around delivery system reform. So around delivery system reform and the ACOs, um, we used the Medicare uh, requirements as the base, uh, and then we 
to the extent that it made sense to tweak those for particular populations, we did that um, to really create a uniformity across the, the payment models. But that is still a multi-payer system. Uh, it will then become the basis for when we move to Green Mountain Care um, and have much uh, more uniformity in our coverage system. So um, our model for Medicare in Green Mountain Care is to continue to have Medicare as primary coverage, but then to have Green Mountain Care as secondary coverage. So, uh, and then the idea there is to ensure that everybody has a uniform benefit package across the state, and also that uh, we have public financing instead of private premiums to reduce things like churn and all sorts of the coverage issues. Yeah. There was another question somewhere. Yes. Greg Meyer from Partners Healthcare. Hi. Kudos to you for, um, for studying context. I think that, that is what's missing from a lot of the study for parents for the perfect intervention. With that said, how are you going to do that? That is a good question. We are still in the process of developing our evaluation model, so I don't think we've really locked in the how yet. We've um, the as a state the way we do evaluation is to contract out with an entity to then actually do the evaluation. We don't do it ourselves with state employees. So um, we've had a number of contracting challenges with finding the right evaluation firm. So that is a piece of it that is still a work in progress. So stay tuned. All right. I think we have a quick one. Otherwise, I want to move on to, oh, you have a quick one. <coughs> what? You, well, you so I, I was put on this panel because uh, I was added to the panel to be the sort of uh, disruptive, uh, you know. Well, <laughs> I'm yeah. shocked. I'm <laughs> shocked. So, so Robin, I, you know, I get it, the single payer and, and contracting and, and developing systems that talk to each other and so on. How are the individual docs going to get paid? And how, how does this affect the individual, individual physicians and the providers on the ground? And are they worried about it? Um, and um, is it going to be anything different than fee for service? I mean, there's still, you got a panel of patients that comes in and you get paid, you know, for everything you do. Is that going to change? And, yeah. and do you have a plan for that? Yes. So it, let's again separate the two worlds. We have post 2017 single payer world and we have pre 2017 delivery system reform. And I think a part of our hope. Uh, moving forward is that the compensation and the reimbursement to physicians and other providers will actually change before we even get to single payer. So in, the, in uh, our current uh, innovation project around delivery system reform, uh, we have for the accountable care organizations, we are using the shared savings reimbursement model. So we have a trend projection of what we think care would have cost without the intervention. We will then measure what care actually costs. Um, and then there are quality measures in place where if certain quality measures are met, then people will get uh, a bonus essentially for uh, or a percentage of the shared savings. Now, because um, our commercial and Medicaid ACOs just started this year. We haven't completed that cycle yet. Uh, but our hope is to move away from fee-for-service to the shared savings model, test out how that's working, uh, also implement episodes of care and the financing that goes with that, um, and then pay for performance, test all of those models, figure out what's working, and then take what works and move that forward in 2017. So it's from, in terms of how the single payer will pay, that's still a work in progress because we really need to see how these delivery reforms flow through. And in terms of how hospitals are changing their actual compensation to individual physicians, um, quite frankly, that's not something I as a state government person am particularly privy to. So um, you can ask some of our providers who might <laughs> happen to be in the room uh, if whether they're looking at changing the compensation models already or if that's something that's still a work in progress on Is their anybody, end. I, mean, I don't so, want to take uh, too much time. Yeah. Yeah. We can come back to this at the yeah. end. Why don't we do that? Because yeah. th these are great things. So you can think about it and, and any Vermont providers who want to expand. Sorry, Norm. <laughs> oh, it's OK. But this is great. Well, let's get Zuri. I'm going to grab my coffee. Excuse me, Zuri. <laughs> It was tantalizingly far from me, that coffee. <laughs> oh. hmm? 
Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it is an honor for me to join you. In so many ways, you guys are my teachers, uh, clinically, and life experiences, and all of your work experiences. As Ellen just mentioned, I am uh, a fourth year medical student, eagerly awaiting graduation next month. Uh, it is tremendously an honor for me to, to join you here and listen to all of your perspectives and stories. Uh, I definitely have a lot to learn from all of you guys. I am going to share what we've known, uh, what we've learned so far from the Massachusetts experience, focusing on the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts Alternative Quality Contract. I'll get into that a little bit uh, in more detail, but I wanted to just start with a couple of very fundamental equations. In graduate school, my training was in economics, so I felt compelled <laughs> to just put up a couple of very simple things to drive the way we think about healthcare spending. So very simply, spending is a product of the prices of things times the quantities of things. And if you want to reduce spending, you can put pressure down, downward pressure on spending <coughs> overall. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize. Spending overall in the form of a global budget. You can put pressure on prices, which Medicare has done many times in its physician fee <laughs> schedule. You can put pressure directly down on qual uh, quantity or volume which managed care try to do. But there's a second fundamental equation that we're dealing with now in the US, specifically in the Medicare program, which is that to reduce the government's share of the spending, which is really the thing that we're most worried about as taxpayers and for the Medicare program, you could do two things. You can tax even further to pay for the Medicare spending, or you can do a kind of shift, shifting from a defined benefit to a defined contribution. This is what's known as the premium support or competitive bidding program. So I put the five red arrows up there to show you the five mathematical ways you can decrease healthcare spending. And in, in real life, any of these ways can manifest in a number of clinical circumstances, many of which I'm just starting to learn about. But in terms of economics, this is what you can do. So the first arrow for spending is what we're going to be focused on today. But I wanted to place it in the context of everything else that's being tried, because this is not the only way to go about addressing healthcare spending. In Massachusetts, a lot of things have happened. And starting in 2006, 2007, we had a coverage reform. Now uninsurance is about 2.4% in the state. A lot of folks without healthcare access before are coming into our primary care clinics, coming into our uh, community health centers. But after 2006 or 2007, there was a slow, gradual, but much, uh, many of uh, you may describe as fast, rather, change in the way that the state thought about payment. So the state moved towards global payment in a series of steps, which I've tried to highlight here above the timeline. These were mostly in the public sector. Concluding with the Governor Patrick healthcare reform, sort of payment reform bill in 2012, signed in August uh, of 2012, which basically featured global payment for provider organizations. Organizations came together to take on these contracts as accountable care organizations. We'll talk about the contractual features in a little bit. There was also regulation of insurance premiums and also regulation of malpractice, a sort of tort reform that the Massachusetts Medical Society had long asked for. But uh, behind, or rather underneath the timeline, are some of the things that's happened in the private sector with the exception of the Pioneer ACO box in the bottom right. But basically, Blue Cross Blue Shield came up in 2009 with this alternative quality contract, which is basically a global payment contract. It initiated it for seven organizations in Massachusetts in 09, 10 in 2010, one in 2011, and six in 2012, up to a total enrollment of about 600,000 by the end of 2010, and now 600, 700, 800,000 so, or so folks uh, by the end of year four or 2012. At the same time, however, we shouldn't ignore what's, ha what's also happening in the state with the other payers. So Harvard Pilgrim and Tufts also began moving towards global payment from fee-for-service. By the end of 2012, Tufts had 90% of its HMO enrollees, 75% of its Medicare Advantage HMO enrollees within global payment from fee-for-service. Harvard Pilgrim began contracting with big organizations like Partners in the State to go into uh, global payment also around those years. The discussion began around those years, but the first contract was signed around 2012, 2013. The Medicare Pioneer Program came along in 2012, 32 organizations, five of which were from Eastern Massachusetts, including the ones that I'll highlight on a later slide. Here's the picture that shows the governor signing the bill in August of uh, 2012 with a quote from him that was much covered in the press uh, down at the bottom. But in the Medicare program, and I won't spend too much time on this, the five red organizations on your left 
are the Pioneer ACOs in Massachusetts that came into the contract in 2012. You'll see in the gray box at the bottom, the total number of Medicare beneficiaries estimated to be within the 360 ACOs by the end of this 2014 cycle. So in those four blue boxes over there are a number of other organizations that joined the shared savings program, not the Pioneer program. The biggest difference is that the Pioneer program is a two-sided contract with shared savings and shared risk if you go above the budget. On the right-hand side for the shared savings program is just a one-sided, mostly, a one-sided shared savings contract without risk if you go over your budget. Some organizations have decided to take on risk within the shared savings program. That's an option, but mostly it's one-sided. Within those four blue boxes, there are 14 additional physician organizations in Massachusetts that entered in either of those, or one of those four cycles. Uh, and they had to have 5,000 beneficiaries minimum, whereas the pioneer organizations had to have 15,000 beneficiaries minimum. And there are other features that I described there, which I'll basically uh, just skip. So Massachusetts was heavily involved in global payment at the cusp of things happening. And previously, we had published some evidence on the alternative quality contract, specifically through the first two years. So the impact of the contract on spending, on quality, on utilization, we've covered through the first four years, but uh, for the first two years, rather. And today, I'll show you some of the new evidence up through the first four years. But this slide basically gives you some features of the AQC. So the AQC is a five-year global payment model that brings hospitals and physicians together within their own determined physician organization to take on this global budget. The budget is tied to inflation growth initially, and now the budget is tied to inflation growth or spending growth, healthcare spending growth in the region that the organization lives in. There's some nuances to the budget that's changed over time, which I'm happy to cover, but basically the budget was tied to some benchmark of spending growth, either the state uh, inflation or your region's healthcare spending. Shared savings and risk were previously determined on an absolute percentage basis, meaning when you, went into the organization, when you went into the contract as the organization, you negotiated with Blue Cross Blue Shield on the percent increases in your global budget year after year for the whole duration of the five years. Those increases used to be a fixed percentage you signed on the dotted line for at the very beginning of the contract. What that involved was at the end of the year, you tally up your entire claims and you measure that against that budget you uh, agreed to, and you had to go through this very complicated reconciliation process. If there was an epidemic in the area, if there were fee, fee increases that were negotiated but unforeseen through other payers or through Blue Cross for other organizations, you had to deal with those things at the end of the year to get the budget right. So that was actually changed after a couple of years of the AQC to where now shared savings and risk are basically tied to your quality. And I'll show you quality on the subsequent slides. Pay for performance metrics, or rather for quality, came through 64 quality metrics, 32 on the outpatient side, 32 on the inpatient side. The 32 on the outpatient, outpatient side match basically uh, one for one with the 32 that are used, or the 33 rather, that are used by the Medicare shared savings program, for which in year one, they only pay for reporting, and in years two and three, they pay for actual performance. Blue Cross paid for actual performance right at the get-go from year one. It used to be that these quality incentives could go as high as 10% of your global budget meaning you would get 10% extra of the global budget at the end of the year for performance on quality measures. But now, it's determined on a PMPM PM, uh, patient um, member basis as opposed to absolute budget basis. And the reason is some organizations have big budgets, some organizations have little budgets, so if you perform to a percentage of your budget for the same level of quality, some organizations could be paid much more than others, so this was more uh, equalizing in terms of quality performance. The, the biggest kicker here clinically uh, was that if you were a patient assigned to a PCP, no matter where your PCP lived, in the old world, wherever you went for care, and I just gave a, uh, this is for our uh, first year medical students in our health policy course, just an example from our teaching hospitals. If you were to go through any of the teaching hospitals, whatever services you received, they would be reimbursed on a fee-for-service basis. In the post-AQC world, you were assigned to your PCP prospectively. All Blue Cross Blue Shield members who are in this contract, they have a primary care physician that they designate at the beginning of the year. The primary care physician belongs within a physician organization and manages that patient's budget on behalf of that organization. If that patient receives care both inside or outside of the home organization, <laughs> the amount paid for that care is debited against the patient's home budget. That's the crucial feature. Here are the quality measures on the outpatient side. I'm showing you process measures on this side, things that I'm sure you guys are very familiar with. And on this slide, the outcome measures and the patient experience measures. You'll notice on the right-hand side, there's a weight. What the weight does is that at the end of the year, you measure, or you basically multiply what you've, uh, how you performed on all of these measures uh, by the weight, 
and then you sum them up for a total weight. This is just ambulatory, so there are two analogous slides for the inpatient side, which I'm not showing. The total quality performance is then sectioned off into five potential levels, or gates. Depending on which gate of performance you've landed in, that determined previously what percentage of the budget extra you got in terms of bonuses, and now it determines how much shared savings or shared risks you face. This is total unadjusted healthcare spending for that first cohort of organizations that entered the AQC in 2009, in the blue line, versus the control group, which I'm using here as the eight other northeastern states. So Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. All of the, uh, all of the HMO and POS uh, enrollees in commercial insurance plans from the comparison states are basically pooled together into a control group. The crucial thing is that all of these enrollees also are in plans that require them to designate a PCP at the beginning of the year and require the PCPs to uh, generate referrals for specialty visits. They might not be capitated. In fact, most of them are not capitated. But the blue line is the AQC group who uh, is capitated. So uh, this is unadjusted, meaning I'm not controlling for age, sex, risk score, time trends, or anything like that. But this is just raw dollars uh, in front of you here. There is a risk-adjusted version of this, which looks very similar. I'm omitting that in the interest of time. But this is that first cohort of seven organizations. Three of them came in from prior fee-for-service contracts. Four of them came in from prior risk contracts with varying degrees of risk. If we break this total spending down into inpatient and outpatient and professional versus facility spending, this is what you see. Now, you know that when you bill for a service, you have to check off basically whether it's a facility claim or a professional claim. Often when you do things in the outpatient facility setting, you generate both a facility or a technical portion of the fee, and you generate a professional or 26 portion of the fee. So this is a way to decompose along the setting of care and the type of claim. And you'll see basically that the savings, so to speak, and I'll define savings uh, in more details if you're interested, but the savings are driven by changes in spending on the outpatient facility side. Now, what happens in the outpatient facility side? This is a setting where you have lights, machines, buildings, equipment, things that contribute to that technical portion of the fee. To build those things, you also usually bill a 26 component or a professional fee. But if you look at outpatient professional spending, there is no really drastic change to the degree that you see in outpatient facility, uh, which is in your uh, upper left-hand corner, the outpatient professional. For the inpatient side, it's a lot noisier. If you look at the y-axis, it shows you that the level of spending on average is actually much lower. So the level of spending goes up to something like $55 for inpatient professional spending and $220 for inpatient facility spending. The units are per enrollee per quarter of the year. So the y-axis is lower because we have a 33-year-old on average age population who is largely healthy working population uh, and families. So we're not talking about a Medicare population here, and that's a, a big distinction that I want to highlight. So inpatient care is not going to be the big part of healthcare spending in this population. And it's much noisier on the right side because we just can't estimate as well. Uh, there's a smaller sample size. But basically, out, outpatient, outpatient facility uh, is where the action is. This is a graph showing you total unadjusted healthcare spending again for that four organizations that came into the AQC in 2010. All of these organizations that came into the AQC in 2010 came in from prior fee-for-service contracts. None of them held risk with Blue Cross prior to coming in. These four organizations, I've just moved the vertical line of implementation a year later. So you see now pre-four years and post-three years. I didn't break them down uh, in the interest of time. This is that one organization that began taking risk with Blue Cross in 2011. Again, noisier because we have a smaller sample size. The red line, uh, as you uh, probably have noticed, is, are all the same. The red line is the comparison states pulled together, all the northeastern states. The uh, brown line at the top here is the uh, set of organizations that came into the AQC in 2012, which, in, which includes partners, uh, soon to be my home organization. And again, I don't break them down uh, for you into the four quadrants. So on the quality side, this is a bar graph that shows you for all four cohorts and the heatest national performance levels, the average unadjusted performance in quality. This is chronic care management, an aggregate measure that sums up all of those things you saw on that uh, quality menu. The blue bars are for the 2009 cohort, the green 2010, purple for 11, and the, the yellowish brown for 12. I kept the color scheme uh, consistent with the spending graphs. But basically, you can see that they more or less move in the upper direction. 
for adult preventive care, which involves <coughs> colonoscopies, mammographies, um, I believe uh, also vaccinations, this is the performance for all four cohorts, again, analogously versus the national HEDIS level. And for pediatric care, uh, this is what we have versus national uh, HEDIS. All of these, we again have adjusted versions of this, uh, but this is just unad unadjusted raw numbers. Um, and I can tell you that the adjusted versions uh, do not change the results meaningfully. And finally, this is my last slide. This is outcome quality. So process measures, we, in economics, we think of process measures basically as another fee-for-service menu. Process measures are not services that you provide with a fee attached to them. They're rather things that you do with a fee attached to them. So in some theoretical sense, a fee-for-service menu, of, uh, such as the Medicare physician fee schedule, is very analogous to a process measure pay for performance menu. However, quality measures are different because quality measures, you have to get through the claims to, to back it out. So here is the red line for HEDIS national quality. Uh, the component measures I've actually listed here, those are the five. Um, the top three are for diabetic patients and the bottom two are for patients with cardiovascular diseases. And the measures for performance, either one or zero, it's a binary measure, are shown there in the parentheses. Basically, uh, the AQC is the blue line. This is just the 2009 cohort, and the red line is uh, our comparison group again. And you see that largely the AQC groups, because they had this huge incentive to care about these quality measures and really try to improve them, because initially it determined how much of the bonus you got uh, uh, in extra in, on top of your budget, and later it determined how much shared savings or shared risks you assumed. It basically was a very strong incentive, and the comparison group, which is just the whole nation, um, did not have that level of incentive. So let me stop there, and I'd be happy to take a couple of questions, but thank you so much for your attention. It's an honor to be here. Um, so before we take a couple of questions, I, I have a mic, okay. so I don't need my own. Um, I just wanted to ask you, so you know, it should be said, and I, I'm sure you would say that you were part of a, a rather large team involved with a lot of years of experience in economics and clinical medicine, and I'm curious, um, in this setting, so you know, having Mike Chernu helping you and Dana Safran and all these people who've thought about this for many years, what was surprising about um, the setup? So for example, I mean, I even just want to ask about your last slide. So this is an impressive improvement in quality in a state that already had relatively good quality and it's commercially insured. Is that surprising? Is it real? You know, what, what was it? <laughs> well, to be honest, I mean, you know, you can play with the denominator, right? So, so I just would love to hear some, some more interpretation of that. Thank you, Ellen. I appreciate it. Let me first just mention that I, I was a small piece of a large team. And my dissertation advisor is Mike Chernu, who's in the Department of Healthcare Policy uh, with us. And we also worked with Dana Safran from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. But aside from the two of them, there was a tremendous number of people who contributed to this work now for the last four years in a number of important ways. Randy Ellis with our risk adjustment and econometric measures, many programmers who helped me learn programming so that we could do this. Um, many people at Blue Cross Blue Shield who elucidated how they measure their measures, how they count their spending, how they count their budgets, how they do their payouts. Um, so I basically wouldn't be here without a lot of people that I, uh, you know, I can't give enough credit to here today. The second thing with respect to your question is that I was surprised. And the reason is uh, when we read the literature in graduate school on pay for performance programs and on uh, capitation contracts, it was usually that pay for performance programs were a small portion of the budget at risk. Right? In the early 1990s, even going into the early 2000s, pay for performance contracts usually involve 1% or a fraction of a percent of a physician organization's budget. And sometimes, or most often actually, it was involved only in the primary care portion of that budget. So I was surprised that Blue Cross actually took on this much, I don't want to say risk, but they put themselves at risk for a lot of bonuses to be paid out. One consequence of that, and this is actually our biggest criticism, and I do really want to highlight this, is that over the first two years, even though we showed savings in the first year of 1.9%, in the second year of 3.3%, in those first two years, the total payouts to these physician organizations exceeded those savings. Blue Cross paid out in shared savings, in quality bonuses, in infrastructure bonuses, a total sum that was greater than the estimated savings. And whenever you estimate savings, no matter what intervention you're looking at, the crucial piece is the counterfactual which is what would the organization have spent in the absence of your intervention. And determining the counterfactual is really the hardest piece of this work because I've shown you the counterfactual as the eight pooled northeastern states. And the reason is by year four, all Massachusetts providers are in the AQC. Nobody's out anymore. So the natural control group has disappeared. But previously it was AQC 
physicians and patients who are not, or Massachusetts physicians and patients who are not in the AQC. So the counterfactual is really important, and I can safely tell you that the counterfactual with the control states doesn't change anything, but our savings initially were outmatched by the total payouts. By the end of year four, total payouts were then exceeded by the savings. So we do have net savings after four years, and that frankly was surprising as well, because from what I've seen as a medical student on the wards and in the clinics, changing physician behavior is extremely hard. <laughs> and there are a lot of things that inspire me, there are a lot of stories that, that grab us that we as medical students gravitate to. One of the most important things for me is how we can work with each other across specialty lines better in our generation, in this new age of payment reform. And to think of all of us together as a collective unit, we bear risks collectively, we bear benefits connect collectively. That type of thinking translated into clinical practice is something I thought would take a long time. These results suggest that that started to happen. The big caveat is that most of the savings came through referrals of patients to lower cost providers as opposed to lower utilization. Uh, so there is one big caveat there. By year four, half the savings were in utilization, so I've yet to find where those um, savings came from. But I was surprised. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Other, other questions? A couple of quick questions before, because I want to make sure Carrie has time to share with you. Austin. Yeah, just one quick question. What was the downstream reimbursement, reimbursement methodology for the physicians? So <laughs> what shifted? Um, yeah. So you, you got a group that takes on risk, but what, what right. methodology were you used on the risk contract? In our qualitative work, most of the physician organizations in the contract did not disperse the risk down to the clinic or physician level. Like the bonuses, or bonuses, yes, but financial risk, no. And the reason uh, was that in the first few years, they wanted to give physicians and clinics enough time to change the way they were doing things without facing the burden of the risk, such as they did in the managed care era. So they were protect the physicians were protected from risk, and the risk was borne at the organizational level. Bonuses work just great, obviously. Right. It's just, it's just to get attention. The other thing is obvious, uh, quite to point it out, but if you flip this to a Medicare population, the right. savings will shift over to the inpatient side. Right. And it will come from, from the Thank you. I agree with that. Just one caveat on the end, though. In the Medicare program, shifting the site of care is really important. When you go from outpatient office to outpatient facility and back, that has big implications for spending. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, quickly, uh, could you address a similar kind of question, how specialist care was handled in this model? You refer, you show the slide with the, with the primary care physician and referrals. How is, how is that handled? So patients are not assigned to specialists as their primary physicians they have to designate, designate a PCP within the contract. So specialists are not, quote unquote, managing the budget on behalf of their organizations for the patient. Specialists are negotiating with primary care groups to get the referrals. And many organizations in Massachusetts are still buying up primary care groups and specialty groups to make the referrals all in-house to, to reduce, quote unquote, leakage. So specialists are in this conversation in a very meaningful way. They just don't manage that budget. They don't have the patient, the patient attached to them. The patient is attached to their home organization, so they can influence the organization, but they don't directly control the referral paths, at least directly, for, for the patients. One more quick question. Brett? Um, how does your control group and the, the slowing of spending growth that you saw within that group compared to what we've seen nationally? I think you know Medicare and a lot of the private payers would say that We've seen a, a slowdown in overall growth, uh, largely driven by utilization and kind of buoyed a little bit by the increase in prices. Do you see that kind of playing out nationally, especially that now a lot of the rest, you know, the rest of the country is more in the same regulatory environment with the ACA as Massachusetts has been since 2006? Well, under the ACA and the Medicare program, at least the year one results show us that a lot of the savings came through readmissions, lower readmissions. Um, for, the, for the private sector nationally, we don't yet know. There are a couple of other large ACO contracts going on that are being evaluated, but we don't know yet how their savings came through. We have general uh, anecdotes of how they've done. And in fact, the Medicare anecdote is very interesting because in the year one of the Pioneer program alone, Medicare reported that they saved $88 billion, of which 55 they gave back to the organizations, 33 of which they kept. The amount of bonuses they paid out in quality was actually larger than $33 billion raising this issue again of upfront investment costs that overwhelm your savings in the initial years of an ACO contract. Uh, so in that sense, we have seen the same experience. Well, thanks. Let's Thank move you. on to Carrie, and we'll come back to these discussions later. Great. Thank you.
Great, hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end for questions too. Um, so first I just want to start out by saying uh, all of the work I'm presenting today is joint with Valerie Lewis at, at the Dartmouth Institute, a sociologist, and Elliot Fisher, who I think most of you know, um, have contributed a ton to this work. So what we're looking at at TDI, I wanted to give you a sense for what we're learning, but also what we're doing here at TDI, so you'd have a sense of what are the new research projects that are going on, since some of you have uh, left in a sense. Um, so the research questions we're looking at are where are ACOs forming in what areas of the country and what do those areas look like as opposed to the areas where ACOs are not forming? What do the ACOs look like in terms of the organizational structure, their capabilities, et cetera? Uh, what strategies are they currently using? They have lots of choices of how to spend their money and their time in the initial years of becoming an ACO. So what strategies are they really focusing on in order to improve quality and lower costs? And finally, a little bit about what Zuri presented, how do ACOs perform? It's very early in the Medicare programs to think about how ACOs are performing, um, but that's where we'd like to go with a lot of the data that we're collecting. We're using a, a mixed method approach to uh, tackle all of these questions. So the first thing I'm going to present today is going to be on the National Survey of ACOs. We fielded two waves of the National Survey of, AC, uh, National Survey of ACOs here at Dartmouth. Um, in addition, we do a lot of qualitative research led by Valerie Lewis, uh, claims analysis of the Medicare claims, and then spatial analysis, which is what I'll start with. So looking at the initial wave of ACOs, the first wave formed by the end of 2012, we saw that at least 55% of the US population was re, um, residing in a health service area, so a small area that contained an ACO. So only about 30% of health service areas have an ACO, but because they're the more uh, populated urban areas, 55% of the population is, um, could visit an ACO if they chose. The areas with the ACOs, remember this is area level analysis, tended to have higher performance on qu quality as measured through claims, higher per capita Medicare spending, um, fewer primary care physician groups, so maybe also larger physician groups, uh, greater managed care penetration, and lower poverty rates. So the, the early ACOs really look like they're forming in places where there might be low hanging fruit if their costs are on average higher, um, already have high quality and are ready to jump into being paid for quality, um, larger physician groups, and then greater managed care penetration, and lower poverty rates, which may or may not mean that it's uh, easier to get patients to engage in their own care. And here's the map of the early ACOs of where they formed. Some of the areas we've talked about today, very dark up here in Massachusetts, where Zuri's talking about a lot of the ACOs. Um, Minneapolis as well is very dark. There's a, a lot of ACOs there and in Oregon. Um, and you can see where Robin talked about in Vermont, the spread as well uh, at the health service area level. But still lots of white where there are no, no ACOs yet. So from the survey, we had a number of surprising findings which we can discuss at the end, but um, one of the major one was that uh, half of the, the ACOs that were out there as of the end of 2012 identified as physician-led. And so the other choices were jointly led by physicians and hospitals, uh, uh, 33% a third said that they were jointly led, but 51 self-identified as physician-led. 78% um, had a majority of physicians on their governing board, um, and they're pretty large. On average, 179 primary care physicians and 241 specialists per ACO, with quite a bit of a range in there. Um, almost a third include either a federally qualified health center or a rural health center, so a, com a community health center is one way to characterize both of those, and almost half include behavioral health providers. So Robin was getting at a little bit of the integration across different types of providers, and the fact that almost half had a behavioral health provider um, was an interesting finding. We overall saw less, Robin mentioned the long-term care integration, we saw less there, only about one in five have a long-term care like a nursing home um, as part of the ACO. 40% have a risk-bearing contract. This is largely through their commercial, commercial contracts. Zuri mentioned that Medicare has uh, two programs and within the shared savings programs, two types of tracks. What we've, what we've observed is that almost all of the organizations who are in the shared savings program are in the one-sided or upside only um, track and not bearing risk in the first three years. So here's a sense for the types of contracts that the ACOs we surveyed have. So 66% of them overall had a Medicare contract half of them had a private contract, a commercial contract, and a quarter of them had a Medicaid contract. But then this Venn diagram shows the overlap. If what we want to get at is multiple payers under the, um, multiple payers under ACO contracts, um, we really want most of them to be in this area. 
but as you can see, only 8% have their patients that are covered by Medi Medicaid, commercial, and Medicare under those contracts. A huge proportion of them um, still only have the Medicare contracts. And a lot of the ones we've seen in the Medicare contracts are actually these um, physician-led organizations that don't have a hospital. They're really a group of physician practices that have banded together to come um, to be an ACO. And we are thinking about that a little bit as the Medicare is kind of the training wheels for these physician organizations to get into these types of contracts. And so they're starting out in the um, non-risk-bearing side of the shared savings program in order to get experience with these types of ACO contracts. Okay, so a little bit about their capabilities and where they might choose to focus their time and attention. One of the biggest things um, we learned, I think, from this is the diversity of organizations that are participating. I mentioned these uh, uh, physician-led organizations that are really sometimes just collections of physician practices that are smaller. Um, less about half are integrated delivery systems, for example. Um, so we see 50% uh, report physician performance measures on quality that are being reported among the peers. So feedback, monitoring, et cetera, on the quality side within the organization. 33%, uh, only 33% giving that same type of information on cost, though, at the physician level. And 46, this kind of gets a little bit into the questions that we were having before, 46% do utilize individual financial incentives, such as bonuses. We ask more detailed questions about this as well, and we're currently analyzing them. Um, in terms of health IT, one of the things that's really been identified as being very important to integration across different levels of um, different uh, settings of care, 87% attested to meaningful use. Um, that's no surprise given the incentives there, but 38% report having the ability to integrate outpatient and inpatient data. Uh, with providers within the ACO. So that's the key part. These are providers that are actually part of the ACO, not just contracts um, with other types of, uh, with uh, different settings of care. 27% report having systems in place to uh, predict patients, for example, that they want to focus on. So predictive risk assessment, something else that has been touted as possibly being the way to save money under these types of programs. In terms of care management, um, one of the other surprises for me was how low these measures are. Um, in terms of the advancedness of these organizations to monitor transitions across different care settings, manage patients um, in the outpatient setting, and um, really manage patients from like an outreach perspective, not just serving them as they come into the office. So you can see um, they're pretty low overall. So here, these are, this is public information. Just a little bit about what we've seen. Zuri touched on some of this across different programs for Medicare. So the physician group practice demonstration, we saw small savings overall, but we saw these high cost utilizers in the duly eligible were the ones most likely to have savings, but that all of the spending reductions basically were concentrated in acute care and the physician group practice demonstration. So far, Medicare has reported these numbers about the Pioneer Program and the Medicare Shared Savings Program, and they just released some quality data about um, the first year for, for the two programs um, across five different quality metrics, but so far there's been little information except to say that the results are somewhat heterogeneous as we saw in the physician group practice demonstration. Only nine of the pioneers achieving savings and about half of the Medicare uh, shared savings participation uh, participants achieving savings. So some of the things we're starting to think about in terms of if if we have a limited window to think about ACOs moving forward, what are the things we need to work on? And the first one, aligning performance measures, you've probably heard about in other settings. Robin touched on it uh, in terms of getting the quality measures the same across commercial, Medicare, and Medicaid, for example, and across different commercial contracts often, they're different too, um, to make it easier for the providers to deal with the administration of the, of the programs. Um, two, ensuring all payer participation. There's a really nice article on Bell and Theta Care um, that was in JAMA a few months ago um, by one of our, our partners, Steve Shortell. And um, what that talks about mostly is that this organization really wants to move forward, but they're having trouble getting a lot of the commercial payers on board to move forward. And actually people uh, who are thinking about this from a policy level have asked us, what do you think will get the private organizations, the commercial payers to move forward more quickly with these ACO contracts? So think about that and let me know if you have any good ideas. <laughs> um, three, improving data sharing across different settings. How does a physician group find out when their patient is in the hospital? How do they get called first, et cetera? 
Um, and then fourth, promoting pathways to full risk. Um, someone in the back there said, oh, I, bonuses count um, the same as taking on risk. Well, that's actually sort of an open question. Do bonuses make people behave the same way as taking on risk? Um, we have- <laughs> That wasn't his intent. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have evidence from, from, uh, from other um, areas, but it would be nice to know in this case, what does it mean that only 60% of these organizations are actually taking on risk? Does that need to be higher in order to motivate change in these areas? So I think that's all I have. Good, and happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Before you start, um, I, I do want to know more about the surprises, and I just want to, um, since most folks were actually in the session with Elliot this morning, he actually touched on already how surprising it was that there were FQHCs forming ACOs, Walgreens has formed mm -hmm. three ACOs, so he's already touched on the, you were surprised about who the players are in this market, but were there other things, again, the things, some of it you look at, oh yeah, it's hard to align incentives. Yeah, you know, that's what you'd expect, but what else did you not expect? Well, I think actually, so the diversity of organizations are not only who's leading them, I would say, I kind of expected a lot of the early adopters here to be the big integrated delivery systems, and a lot of them are the smaller physician groups. Um, and you know, whether they're less sophisticated or not remains to be seen, whether they can um, put things in place the same way a centralized system can, or whether they're better at it. For example, if they don't have a hospital, they just try to keep the patients out of the hospital. Um, and then on the advanced measures, I talked a little bit about the care management ones, but overall those were, for the earliest adopters in this program, those were surprisingly low to me. But as I learn more about it, it's not surprising. <laughs> if as I learn more about it through qualitative research, it's not surprising. All right, let's open it up to audience questions for Karen. And we can, we're almost out of time, so if you want to share the time, that's fine too. Well, it's, well we, we have time for a few. Okay. Paul has a question. Carrie, to what degree do we see non providers <coughs> participating in the ACO, for example, public health, um, in, not necessarily in the, well, I guess in whatever manner, because if you think about population health, how do we get others who are interested in population health? actually um, impacting our ACOs and what they're looking at and things like that. So we have examples of uh, other non-provider uh, folks actively participating. So an example might be social services. Is that kind of what you have in mind? Social Housing, for example? Public health, health. Officials, yeah. employers who are um, in population health. I mean, from a, from a population of ACO standpoint, it's very, very low. Um, I think there's a few good examples where we see uh, some integration and people thinking about it at a community level, but uh, overall across this group of uh, places that I'm reporting on, it's very low. I have a question. So we've been talking about healthcare, healthcare reform from a, an input perspective, mm -hmm. but really surprised that there was nobody talking about the patient perspective, which is the third leg of the triple aim, if you will, that's one. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, the outcome indicators are really not outcome, they're process indicators. And people respond to it so they get their bonus, but in fact reflect in true changes in outcome, patient experience. The final one is that looking at your uh, HIT, when you have incentive, lots of money, uh, you get 87% participation. But the purpose of the HIT is improve care, access to care, information measurement, and the numbers, even for accountable care organizations, as opposed to leading good quality, is pitiful, less than 30%. So really, how are you going to transfer this wonderful work to really practice that indoors? I remember in the 80s and the early 90s when Mesh came on board, same thing. The prices came down until the system adapt and went up again. How can we prevent this? And everything again, Finally, that, that the best thing that's probably can control costs is that the high deductibles that people never have a stake mm -hmm. in the game, and maybe that's <laughs> the other stuff is really basically if the consumer uh, is taking the game, that uh, maybe the changes would happen. And I think again, measurement of outcome, system outcome, it really has nothing to do with individual outcome. But I think we're all consumer of healthcare, and we we should at least envision what a healthcare system should look like, and as a consumer, because I'm a purchaser of that. So I, I don't know how, you know, a lot of stuff. Yeah, so that was, a, you touched on you a lot of important seconds. points. <laughs> yes. Um, so first, from a patient perspective, I think that there's very little research actually going on right now uh, from a patient perspective. I should note that of the quality measures, some of them relate to patient satisfaction and come from patient surveys um, in the Medicare program and many times in the commercial quality measures as well. But um, 
I mean, a lot of the goals of primary uh, of accountable care organizations, when they think about if you read their mission statements, for example, really are about making healthcare more easily consumable for for patients, more easy easy to access and easy to deal with. I'm sure if you've all um, seen from the patient perspective. Um, to the other points. So the cost sharing is a trend across the board in the commercial contracts, right? Medicare is has been fixed um, in terms of their cost sharing for a long time. Um, and a lot of these programs that we were talking about today are um, under Medicare, where there's 20% cost sharing in Part B. But um, what have you seen, Zuri, about cost sharing in Massachusetts? Have they made any patient changes at the same time as they've made changes in the compensation to practices? They have. Uh, there's been a gradual rise in high deductible health plans. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, as well as tiered networks for patients. Um, Blue Cross and other commercial payers are implementing tiered networks around the same time in the as sort of the last couple of years of our evaluation. Um, the tiered networks, uh, as you know, they vary co-pays and cost sharing based on either cost levels or quality levels, <coughs> whatever profile the insurer uses uh, for the physician organization. And it's hard to tease out the contribution of a tiered network versus global payment on healthcare spending or quality or utilization in any of these organizations, but um, they are kind of happening at the same time. What are we missing? <laughs> I, th I think actually in a minute, I want to open it up to the group, but first, can you hand the microphone to Ken? Because I want to ask, Ken, Ken's role was to weigh in and give a little reality check as a provider who is, if John Skinner were here, he would say the following, so I'm going to channel John. <laughs> that somebody who's been a revenue center for your health system for a long time, you are gradually transitioning to a cost center for your health system as you see these changes. You know, what's the, what's the reality check from a provider going through such dramatic That's a heavy changes? burden to bear. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, 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 I'm not sure I want to answer that one. Greg can answer that for me. <laughs> Greg, Greg can speak to that. <laughs> but um, it strikes me that um, you know, all of these things that we're talking about now, we're talking about it like, like, you, like you said, sir, from, the, from the, um, the patient and the payer, the, the provider perspective is sort of grassroots, you know, what does it look like from the bottom looking up? This is all stuff looking from the top down. And um, frankly, uh, it's the boots on the ground and the patients on the ground, um, whether it's by patients making choices by choosing higher deductible plans or providers choosing to or not do something at high cost to the system or lesser cost system, that's what's really going to drive the costs in healthcare. I mean, frankly, we as providers are the people that decide whether, with our patients, you know, hopefully in a shared, shared decision-making mo mode, whether or not to do something. Uh, and um, frankly, so I think there's a lot of other things Zuri, that have driven the costs down, that whether it's the, the you know, higher cost, higher deductible plans or, frankly, external things. Like in my area, and as an interventional cardiologist, we have now this appropriate use criteria and, um, our, and public reporting came into place in Massachusetts. And our volume of angioplasty has gone down 20, 30% over the past uh, five years. And I think that surgical volume has also gone down. So frankly, these things are all, it, it's a, such a moving target. Um, Can I ask a but question? yeah, what please. What was the impetus for your organization to put those things in place? Um, well, the, <laughs> this is driven by the American College of Cardiology, uh, wanting to do the right thing, probably as much as anything else, to be honest with you, and recognize that we are a part of the problem, and we don't want to be a part of the problem. We want to be part of the solution, which is why everybody's here, by the way, uh, which is awesome. Um, so uh, ACC put into into place this AUC, and by the way, it caught a lot of people off. Uh, off their, you know, uh, off their guard, and um, put a lot of providers into very uncomfortable positions uh, along the way. And it's one of those things that happened too fast without actually bringing along the. Pro it's a great example. Happened too fast without bringing along the providers as as part of the the, the uh, and making them part of the solution. And you guys have all pointed out. You know, I love, Robin, your, your comments about it takes time. We, we reached out into the community to bring them, make them help us come up with the solutions because then they'll be bought in. And I, and I worry that our providers are, frankly, not bought into this system. And, and Austin, you sort of asked the question, well, what will bring them, you know, on board? What will make them feel like they're part of the solution, not part of the, part of the problem? Um, I fundamentally believe everybody's, you know, wants to, all, most providers really do want to improve the system and, and 
do the right thing, but yeah, they also don't want to suffer either. So, you know, I'll, I want to think we should open up to everybody. Yeah, people, we, we have about five minutes. We should take the extra five minutes, and then people announce your names. We are we are keeping people from their lunch, but let's let's <laughs> open it up for a few a few questions because this is great. Thanks. Uh, I'm Beth Brady, a surgeon in, in Hartford. And to that point, get into your point. I think that it's fear. There are two issues, and, and get into the lack of measurement. The issue is it's fear at the ground level. Hospitals are worried about the reimbursement. Physicians are worried about the reimbursement. They see what's coming. They are organizing. Everyone. The other thing that, that's really striking is a total lack of IT infrastructure. That's the thing. And so with what we're doing on the ground, we don't have a robust IT system to display what we're doing. So you're giving great data, looking from above. Those of us who are in the trenches want to tell you, but we don't have the infrastructure IT-wise yet to do it. So it's a process. Yeah, actually, you, you sort of touched on this. One, uh, the difference between meaningful use and something that operates to the extent you need is vast, especially in the terms of the networking between different systems. It, it, you can be very high in meaningful use measures just by doing certain things within your organization, but going across organizations is where it's very low. Mike, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, one question. One is, what makes you think that the consumer is not going to revolt at this like they did in managed care back in the 90s when they ran HMOs and all that? That's one. And what, aren't these ACOs, the second part is, aren't these ACOs just going to end up becoming monopolies and be just as bad as our providers were in the I'll just say one comment about the consumer revolt. You'll hear it when they pay for their high deductible health care plan, and then they get suddenly a huge bill from the hospital, and they, they really didn't know what they were getting into because they were healthy when they signed up for this plan. That's well, I can give one Elliot Fisher quote for that. He says that, um, so the main difference, one of the main differences between HMOs and ACOs is that provider, patients can go elsewhere Every provider is not an ACO yet, and so in the managed care era, they were tied to one set of practices, and now Elliot says the best pasture, uh, the best fence is a great pasture, so they will want to keep their patients in their system by making it work for them. Yeah. And Elliot have gone back and forth on this number of times. That is one of the main differences, but even in the example we talked about here, there was easy assignment and choice. And there is, we seem to see, even in those most sophisticated medical groups, they've been globally capitated to primarily think of large medical group taking global cap for the last 30 years that actually sort of survives, performs well under those. We put the same docs in an ACO environment that, that's an attributed population versus an assigned population, and performance varies widely. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's very interesting. We probably should put quite a bit more study behind that as well because it, there is a drastic difference in performance in those models. We didn't really address the, the monopoly question is basically what you're saying, which is aren't we just giving unprecedented market power? Um, as an economist, obviously I care deeply about that. I am concerned about that. I think the number, and, and it's not been quantified as well as it could be, but the amount of waste in our system due to lack of coordination, anyone who's had an interaction with our medical system any time in the last decade has felt it personally and acutely. Um, uh, but I think the scope for savings and economies of scale from the integration probably far outweigh the loss from market power. and. We don't have to let the market power go unbridled. You can watch very closely and basically, um, you know, rein in sort of monopolistic behavior that is not going to meet the welfare of the population. So that, that would be my take on that. And I would just say, I'm from the government. I'm here to help. <laughs> so. Oh, we might have to end with Well, that. I think one way that you could help is greater transparency on commercial oh, yeah. prices yeah, yeah. is what a yes. lot of people are calling for exactly. um, as where uh, that might impact it. So, I mean, what Alan's getting at is the trade-off between consolidation and coordination. If you want people to be more integrated, to coordinate care better across providers, you know, there's a very fine balance in that trade-off. So, I just, you want to weigh in? Because I, I would love to, I see people are hungry, and I know you guys have to make it over to the Hanover Inn for lunch. Check out by so, noon. Oh, gosh. And you have to check out by, oh, well, hopefully they'll be nice. Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much thank, to our panelists. Really great discussion. Um, really wonderful. And thank you.